worship this morning. Have you ever noticed that in times of worship, how the atmosphere changes? Have you ever noticed that? Well, that's, that's one of the things that I want to encourage you in, is in the area of worship. See, because what we think is worship is different from reality. And you know, we come to church and sometimes we, we have some great praise songs and great worship songs, but that's not what worship is about. So I want to speak spe specifically about the worship that attracts God's presence. The worship that attracts God's presence. And can I just encourage you, um, before we get into the Word, two things that, that, that I need to remember. First of all, we are going to stop and have a time of fellowship at the very end, a cup of tea and coffee. You're welcome to stay for that. Um, and I've got the whole <laughs> Bible study. Can I, can I really encourage you to, to get the notes and get, and, and if possible, to participate in the Bible study? And the only reason I'm saying that is because in the Bible study, you can cover the subject in a lot more depth than you can on a Sunday. There's an opportunity for you to interact and discuss and explore the different things that come through the message. Much more detail than what we can cover in a period of time on a Sunday service. And it's hard sometimes to, to compact everything because the subject of worship it, it can be very misunderstood because we sometimes don't really know really what worship is or how to correctly respond in worship. That's why I said that our concept of worship is different. It's more than just singing a song and coming together and singing a good song. The truth is that if you want to go to a place and just sing, and sing some good songs. There's lots of places that you can go to where you can do that as well as church. Yeah? So it's not, and you can have just as much a good time. And you can even get involved in different activities. But when we come to church, worship of the Lord is different. And you know, one of the things that I realise is that when we're looking for God to be among us, when we're looking for God's presence, which is one of the reasons why we come together, is because we, we believe and have that expectation that God is going to move among us and do the thing that only He can do. Amen? Amen. Come on. That's the truth. Because in that moment, God can accomplish far more than we ever possibly could in our natural selves. And that happens as we begin to worship Him. And you know, one, one of the things that we tend to think is, well, all I need to do is I need to pray more and that will bring God's presence. I need to read the Bible more and that will bring God's presence. I need to fast more. I need to praise. I need to study. And there's a whole lot of other things that we think we need to put the effort in to praise and worship the Lord. Now there's, a, there's an element of, I understand there is an element of that might be applicable. Because when we come in, naturally speaking, in, our, in ourselves, we are a little, maybe you're, not, maybe you're a bit reserved. I'm quite, I'm quite an extrovert person. So I don't find it very difficult. I understand that not, <laughs> not everybody's the same as me. We're not, we're not all the same. Thank the Lord for that, you see. God hasn't created us the same. We all, we all come from different backgrounds, different places, different cultures, different upbringing. Even how we express ourselves is different. And that's how God created us. So for each of us to come into church on a Sunday, we might be a little bit reserved. And we might find it a bit difficult to raise our voice, or even to raise our hands. You know, I remember the time when the, the church background that I was brought up, you, you weren't really encouraged to raise your hands. It was a very dogmatic 
uh, system, and, and that was it. He just did what everybody else did. But that's what, what worship is about. And that's not the heart of worship. And sometimes we think, well, if I just do more, if, I just, if I'm just there and do more and try harder, that will bring God's presence. No, nothing could be further from the truth. The truth is that God is already here. That's the truth. Now here's the thing because we know that God is omnipresent. That's a nice fancy word. That means everywhere present. God is always here, but the truth is that sometimes we are not always aware of God's presence amongst us. That's why I said, do you notice how the atmosphere changes when we begin to worship the Lord? How we become more aware of God's presence as we worship. He is already here. Matthew, 28, Matthew chapter 18 verse 20 says, For where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I among them. Even if it's only a handful, even if it's only a couple, where two or more are gathered together in my name, we are gathered here together in the name of Jesus and because of what Jesus has done. Yeah. Amen. Because Jesus has come into our hearts and into our lives and he has transformed us and changed us and made us a new creation in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians 5.17 If anyone's in Christ, he is our new creation and we're amongst new creations today if you belong to the Lord. But where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I among God. Jesus made a promise. God makes a promise that whenever we gather together because of Jesus and because of who he is and what he has done, he is right here with us. Right now. See, that this is the promise that is not at some future point. See, when we study scripture, we see that for thousands of years, the Old Testament, when you read the Old Testament, they were looking forward to a saviour that was going to come. And he was going to deal with all the things to do with sin and all of that. And for 2,000 years, they were looking forward to the arrival of Jesus the Messiah. All the prophets of the Old Testament were looking forward to that time. But we are living in a time where that event has already occurred because Jesus has come. Amen. It's just that we are not always aware of the presence of Jesus amongst us. But the truth is we can be. We can be as we begin to worship him. I have noticed sometimes that we can come in and we can begin, even if we just begin to sing the song, that's okay. Because we've got to start somewhere. You know, you don't just you don't just jump jump necessarily. You, you, might, you might be the person that likes to jump if it depends. <laughs> I don't know, because that might be your character and nature, but not all of us like to jump in at the deep end. Some of us like to break in and <laughs> come in gradually. And that's okay, because we begin in our natural selves. When we come to church, we come together to build and encourage one another and to be blessed by the Lord, and to meet with the Lord, and for the Lord to meet with us. So the truth is that God is always here, but we are not always aware of it. But the truth is we can be. And, and the scripture tells us, like we've already discovered, and you'll find these in Jeremiah in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, 33, verse 33, Jeremiah 32 and verse 38 and in Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 these are some, just some of the, the scriptures that we're uh, recognising this morning. Jesus promises that he, God, is with us and he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. In those scriptures that I mentioned it says there, they shall be my people. 
and I will be their God. That was the promise in the Old Testament. The people, I know it's directly speaking about the nation of Israel, but it's also talking about you and I in Christ Jesus this morning. We are among the people of God this morning. And it says, they shall be my people and I will be their God. And Revelation 21 is really good, uh, verse 3. And that basically says that he, God himself, is not only is he going to be our God, but he says, I will be in the midst of them. I will be among them. Now, I realize that the context is different. But God is already here by his Holy Spirit and by his omnipresence, the fact that he's a brilliant presence. But I want to draw your attention to this thing about worship. Come back to this theme. John chapter, if you jump over to John chapter 4, this is our main scripture for today. John chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. This is Jesus speaking. Now, we know that the context is that he's, he's speaking to a person specifically. And he's, he's talking about, this is where the Samaritan woman meets Jesus. And they're talking about, where, where do we go to worship? What, how, it's a similar conversation that takes place. There's a whole conversation that takes place throughout the whole John chapter 4 between Jesus and this Samaritan woman. And this, a conversation takes place of, about lots of different things. And it comes to worship. And it says in verse 19, let's just take it from verse 19 so that we can get the context of this. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. But watch what Jesus says. Can I just interrupt here? Let's just take it a bit at a time. See, what this conversation is now coming into is where do we worship God? This is the conversation that's taking place. Is it the mountain? Is the place, you know, to go to a high place and, and, and worship? Or where, where do we go? This is, this is the context of what we're about to read. This is a little bit of the background. And here's what, here's what we need to understand when, as it relates to worship. It doesn't matter where we are in relation to worship. We can worship God wherever we are, whether it's in church together today, or whether we're in our house, or whether, no matter where we go, whether we're out on a walk. I don't know about you, but I love to go by the beach and go down and just worship the Lord. It just, I, I don't, I, it, that's just for me. I like to do that. It's just re relaxing and peaceful. And I like to go and just worship the Lord. It's one of the things that I like. I don't get to do it very often. But it's one of the things that I really enjoy doing. I just find it really refreshing and relaxing. But wherever we go, God's presence is there because He promised that he would be there. And we'll come to that in a little bit. So this is the background. The background is, where do we worship the Lord? Well, let me jump ahead and give you the answer. The truth is that we can worship God wherever we are. That's the truth. That worship should be part of our lifestyle. It should be part of our Christian uh, experience and lifestyle. But let's move on. I want to draw your attention specifically to what Jesus says. Jesus said to her, Women, believe me, the hour is coming, watch what he says, when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But watch what Jesus says. But the hour is coming. And now is, watch this, the hour is coming and now is when what? The true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him 
must worship in spirit and in truth. Wow, there's a lot to take in there. There's a lot. But what I want to draw your attention to and what I want to highlight is look at the response because the conversation, as, the, as we've already explained, is around this thing of where do we go to worship? But what does Jesus say? The first thing he, he challenges is you can't worship what you don't know. Come on. You worship what you do not know. That's, what you That's a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenging statement. It's not a question, it's a statement. These are the words of Jesus. You worship what, what you do not know, but we know what we worship. <laughs> we know whom we worship. That's what Jesus is saying. But I want to skip on. The hour is coming. Jesus is talking about something that's, that he's revealing here. Sometimes to be able to worship God in fact, I want to suggest to you that in order to worship God, we need to have a revelation of who Jesus is. Can I say that again? In order to worship God, we need a revelation of who Jesus is. And we'll see that it becomes clear in Scripture. The hour is coming, and now is. What's coming? What she's about to say. He's just about to open it up. When true worshippers... Wow. Now there's a whole question. <laughs> there's a question for you to begin to think about and mull over and contemplate. What does it mean to be a true worshipper? I'm not going to cover that in length today because we don't have time. But it's a, a thought process for you. But watch what it says. When true worshippers will worship the Father, what? In spirit and in truth. So to me, there is two prerequisites for worshipping God the Father. It said we can only worship him in spirit and in truth. These are Jesus' words, remember. So what did he mean by that? What does it mean? We'll come to that in a little, little second. And it goes on to say, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is looking for, people, for true worshippers to worship in this way. And then verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship. Wow. Must. Yeah, come on, you picked it up. It was the first thing I noticed. Must worship in spirit and in truth. That's another challenge for us. Because what does that mean? So what does it mean? And I want to unpack a little bit of that this morning for you. To, be, to help you to understand what this thing about worship really is. The first thing it says is to worship in spirit. What does that mean? In, oh, 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 no, it means, first of all, it means not in the flesh. Not in our natural selves. We will never really accomplish a lot by trying to worship God naturally ourselves. Because what happens soon enough, and we've all, we've all experienced it, sometimes we experience it in our prayer time, where we try to pray, and we don't, it's like Romans 8 says, we know not how we ought to pray. Worship is the same, praise is the same. Have you ever, have you ever, sung a praise song and you want to praise the Lord there's something rises within you and you begin to praise that spontaneous praise or you begin to worship that spontaneous worship and what happens you soon run out of words to say we don't know how, 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 how often can I say hallelujah praise the Lord <laughs> you know that's what we know I can only say it so many times and then I try and vary, vary worship, you know, we try and vary with the phrases the words that we use, and that, that's fine. So first of all, we need to understand that it's not in the flesh, not in our natural self. Now we might start off just by singing along, that's a good tune, I think, you know, it's a nice happy, yeah, nice bouncy, happy tune, and we can enjoy it and, and, and celebrate. That's good, it's good to start. Now we might start in our natural selves, but when we begin to enter 
and to God's presence, responding to God, that's when things begin to change. We might start naturally, but then we begin to experience God's presence because he's already here, as we've said. And as we realise and recognise that he's here, it's not so difficult then to begin to raise a hand. The trees of the field will clap their hands. There was nothing wrong with clapping, and there's lots of different ways that they can praise, just as many ways that they can worship as well. And again, I don't have time to explore all the different ways that they can praise and worship. But the thing that I want to draw your attention to is the fact that God says, the scripture says that God is looking for people that will worship him in this way. So it's not in the flesh and we need, we need to have the help of the Holy Spirit. We'll come to that a little bit. But before we do that, it's important to understand something, another great truth. Jesus says we cannot worship what we do not know. There is something that's absolutely critically fundamental to this whole thing around worship. We cannot worship Jesus if we do not have a relationship with Jesus, a faith relationship. We need to be, in the words of John chapter 3, verse 3, we must, this is one of the other must, Jesus speaking to a great relig religious leader, one of the greatest religious leaders of his time and era started speaking to Jesus and Jesus says to him you, in John chapter 3 verse 3 and 5 you must be born again and, Nic and the Nicodemus didn't understand well, Jesus what are you talking about it's impossible how do you know he didn't understand because he says it's impossible for someone to enter his mother's womb a second time and he's a great scholar and he didn't understand what Jesus was saying to him what does this mean to be born again? And Jesus says to him these words, unless a person is born again, you cannot see the kingdom or enter the kingdom. That's how critically important this is. We cannot worship what we do not who we do not know. <laughs> we cannot <laughs> worship Jesus. We cannot worship God the Father unless we have that personal relationship with the Father through Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. And it's the same for every person that lives. It's the same truth for us, that we are those who have been born again of the, of the Holy Spirit. We've been born again by relationship with God. That's what it means to come to faith, personal faith relationship personal faith relationship and it's a requirement if, if you were a stranger to me thankfully you're not a stranger I might be a little bit strange at times but I'm not a stranger <laughs> I can take the care of myself as a lot <laughs> but if we were complete strangers you might be a little bit hesitant to come up and speak to me or, or likewise if, I, if you were a stranger I might be hesitant to come up and speak to you Although I like speak, speaking to people, so I don't find that too difficult either. But if I didn't have a relationship, if I didn't know you as a brother and sister in Christ or a friend, we might pass each other in the street and never think twice about it. It's important. Why, why is this relevant, you're saying to me this morning? We cannot worship what we do not know. You wouldn't walk up to a stranger in the middle of the street and go, I love you. <laughs> well, how do you love me? Because you don't know me. I've never met you before in my life. So we cannot worship what we do not know. It's like it's like a marriage. I tell my wife I love her because I'm in a relationship with my wife. And I'm married to her. <laughs> every, relation, every relationship has an expression. Even a relationship of friendship, when, if, when you go to visit somebody that you're, you're friendly with, you like to meet them and you, and you say, how are you doing? You have a conversation, great to see you, get, get to know them, and so on. <coughs> you begin to build a relationship. We cannot worship what we do not know. 
We can only worship by relationship. We can only praise and know Father, know Jesus by relationship. That's what John chapter 3 says. You must, it's a requirement. In fact, there's a lot more that we can say about that. Because it says, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot see or understand the things of God. Why? Because you've not got that faith relationship. And until you're in that faith relationship, until you take that step of faith in believing that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be and who the word reveals him to be, until you have that relationship, you will never understand the things of God. And it's only when we come to faith in Christ that he begins to give us the revelation and understanding <coughs> of who he is and what he has done. <coughs> Though we cannot worship what we do not know, we need relationship first. We need relationship first. But then we've also got to move beyond that relationship. What does the relationship do? It allows us to begin to respond. When someone tells when someone's in a relationship and tells you, I love you, you say, I love you too. You respond in relationship. And one of the things that we need to understand <coughs> is worship is a response. It's an expression of our relationship with the Father. Now we might start, as I say, in the natural, but we move beyond ourselves as the Holy Spirit enables us. So that's what that means to begin with. Second thing it says, Spirit and in truth. Well, the scriptures say that the word of God is true. John chapter 1, verse 14. And Jesus himself is the truth. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus is truth. <coughs> and you'll find not only is he truth, but he is the one who can come it. John chapter 14, 6, Psalm 119, 160. And there's lots of places like that. But the truth is that we can only truly begin to worship God because of our relationship with God through Jesus by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John chapter 14, 6, and I'm I know that most of you will remember these verses. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Now, it's even more emphatic than that. If you could possibly get more emphatic. But if you were to understand the, the original, and I'm not going to try and be a show off, that's not what I'm here for. But the original language, Jesus the actual words that Jesus says, and I'm just going to tell you what he actually says. He says, I am the only way. Jesus makes an extraordinary claim. He makes an extraordinary claim. I am the only way. I am the only truth. And I am the only life. And you will find that Jesus makes a lot of extraordinary statements and claims through the whole Gospels. I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. All the I am saints in the, in the Gospels. He makes some extraordinary claims and statements. And Jesus is the embodiment. He is truth personified. He is truth incarnate. He is the truth. He is the only way. Amen. He is the only way that we can come to relationship. I know there's a little bit of a gospel message in this, unintentionally. But in the book of Acts, it says salvation, our salvation, our, our relationship. This word, we use this word salvation, but sometimes we don't explain what salvation means. It means to have that personal faith relationship to commit our lives to follow Christ and live for Christ. That's what salvation means. But it says in, in the book of Acts, salvation is found. Acts chapter 4, I think it is. Acts chapter 4, 12, roughly, if I remember correctly. Salvation is found in no one else. 
There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the name. He is the one who saves us. We could not, cannot, will not ever save ourselves. <coughs> it is through Jesus that we have this relationship aspect. It's because of who Jesus is and what he has done that we have this relationship. And because of that relationship, we have the opportunity to begin to worship God in this prescribed manner, to worship God in spirit and in truth. And it says that the true worshippers will worship this way, and God is looking for those, for those who worship, must worship in spirit and in truth. Worship is more than just singing a song. Worship is something that comes as an overflow. In Ephesians chapter 5, I want to take you there very quickly because we're almost out of time. Please get the Bible study because <laughs> there's a lot more detail that we can be covered in the Bible study than we can cover in our brief time together this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 from 18b and 19. Watch what it says. It says, Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. Uh, I read another version and it says, and when it says the word music, I like this word. It says, sing and make melody. <laughs> sing and make melody in your hearts to the Lord. I love that version. It doesn't matter. Worship is more than singing. We can, you know, even if you've got the most terrible voice, it doesn't matter. Worship is more than singing. And it does, in fact, it doesn't even matter if you can sing or not. Somebody once said, even the crows have the voice. Even the crows have the voice. And it doesn't matter whether you're a good singer or whether you can't sing at all. Because worship is more than about singing. Worship is something that comes from the inside. And it begins to overflow as we begin to take our eyes off ourselves. As we turn our eyes upon Jesus. Like the old song says. Hymns and spiritual songs. 
I never noticed that before. <laughs> and then it says, sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. Why is that important? Because when we come together, we come together to build and encourage one another. But what are we, what are we building and encouraging one another to do? We're in building and encouraging one another to have a better, closer relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Am I right? That's, why we, that's one of the reasons why we come together. To encourage one another and to help one another to have that better, closer relationship with Jesus. That's why we're here. That's one of the things that we do. We build and encourage one another. And the scripture says we have to do that even more and more as we see time progressing, as we see the day of God fast approaching. Sing and make music in your heart, to God. So it doesn't matter whether you can sing or not. Here's the truth that God is never interested in whether you can sing or not. God is interested in your heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks in the heart. God is interested in what's inside you, what makes you tick. <coughs> Why do you worship? Because we worship because we're in a relationship with Jesus. Amen. We need the help of the Holy Spirit, of course we do. But we have that help readily available. And the last thing I want, last point that we're on right now. <coughs> worship requires everything. It requires everything. And you find this in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, Luke chapter 10, verse 27. It says there, You shall love the Lord your God. How? With all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. It requires every part of you. Worship, to worship God in the spirit and in truth. It involves loving him first with your heart, your soul, your mind and your strength. But more than that, worship, as I've already told you, it's a response of love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. It is, and this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He first loved us. He first loved us. <coughs> My dear brother and sister, I want to encourage you that God loved you first. He cares for you first. He's the first to make the move. Says that whilst we were still sinners, in the book of Romans, whilst we were still sinners and separate from God, God made the first move and sent Jesus. He sent Christ to die for our sin. As, a, as an act of love, as a demonstration of love, and everything in worship is a response to love. Everything in our Christian lives is a response. We respond in kind. He first loved us and we respond to that love. We know that God loves us because God's character and nature says God is love. We know that that's God's very character and nature, but it's more than that. Because then God, if that's what it is, then God loves because he has to love. No, God made a choice. He intentionally chooses to love us. And everything because of love is a response. It's a response of love. And in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, the last, the last verse, the great verse, this is a picture in heaven. This is a picture of worship in heaven. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and glory and honour and blessing. Why do we worship? Because the simple truth is, is because He is worthy of our worship. We, he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our love. He is worthy of our adoration. Why? Because he first loved us. He first loved us. And he still loves us with an everlasting love. 